thank you for the introduction. Um, so we are a little bit early, so I add some extra slides to uh, fill up the gaps. So it will be a bit of uh, improvisation today. Uh, thank you for joining the, um, my presentation today. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, accelerating simulators for robotics reinforcement learning. One more. So at the time that I was invited for this tutorial, I was working at Google Brain, Google Brain Robotics, uh, working on um, quadruped locomotion and also re, um, physics simulation for quadruped simulation. And um, so at that time, I was planning to talk about Pi Bullet and about um, Rex and some other Google technologies. But uh, since I uh, moved to NVIDIA um, a few a months ago, I thought it's a good idea to also talk a bit about uh, the tools of reinforcement learning at NVIDIA, otherwise it would be perceived a bit odd, right? So um, I'm going to kind of uh, blend a bit of the old work at Google, which is the PyBullet and the um, Tiny Differential Simulator and Rex, and also show a little bit about the tools that NVIDIA has. They have some excellent tools for reinforcement learning as well. So um, in the screen, you can see uh, some projects that I've been working on at Google Brain and also um, some projects that are being done at uh, NVIDIA. So the first is uh, Simtoreal uh, that is uh, done with the quadruped robots in 2018. I will talk a bit about that. Then there is uh, learning agile locomotion with um, the Lycago robot, also a quadruped. There are some very recent work that I've been doing with Eric Heide that is quite exciting, I think, where we try to learn the um, URDF file from video. So typically, if you want to create a robot simulation, it's quite a bit of effort to create a robot in a simulation. So you have some tools like Gazebo or um, Blender or other tools to, modif to model your robot. And uh, it's non-trivial, actually. So, um, we, we thought it's good uh, if we can actually use machine learning to extract the URDF file straight from video. So we have some early results there. Then there is, um, NVIDIA has done some work with ETH Zurich. You can see this animal uh, robot that I will show in some of the videos. It's quite amazing how they actually can train in the simulation and deploy it in the real world with almost no um, simple real gap. So, of course, it's about simulators as well. So I show you some simulators and talk a bit about simulators. So my bullet is one of them. I've been working on bullet for a long time. It's like maybe almost 20 years, actually. So the first um, maybe 10 years, this was for the games. So I was at Sony PlayStation at the time. And um, there were some big games that uh, used bullet. Uh, some of them you might know, um, Grand Theft Auto 4. Um, that's kind of quite popular game and they use bullet as well under the hood as part of their physics engine. So what it means is that I worked for Sony, but some of the time of the year I had to visit um, Rockstar to integrate the physics engine into their game and also other games. But uh, then I worked in um, for some movie, movie simulations, still the same bullet engine, but more targeted for a movie simulation. Uh, so like Pixar and DreamWorks and Sony Imageworks, they all used uh, Bullet for some of the shots, like Shrek of 2012 for the disaster movies. And after I've been doing that for a couple of years, um, I was lucky I got a uh, technical Oscar for that. And then I thought, okay, um, and I know that's not true. I got an invitation from Andy Rubin, who's the person who, who led the Android project, to join Google to work on robotics. I had no clue about robotics eight years ago, so I thought, why not? Let's try it. <laughs> um, so I got a kind of a one-on-one course what, what robotics means. I worked with a lot of nice teams like Boston Dynamics, uh, Shaft on locomotion, and a lot of other good people uh, who teach me how to do robotics, including SMD soldering and uh, motor controllers and P PWM, uh, etc. So after a couple of years, um, I kind of um, understood what robotics needed, and it was not a C++ library. So I moved into Python, since uh, ROS and Gazebo and a lot of the other um, machine learning libraries or Python, of course. But I, I focused on PyBullet from then on. And um, okay, so then uh, more recently at Google, I was working on Tiny Differential Simulator. You can see that's the second. Um, at the bottom there, the bubble one. So if you have been doing uh, reinforcement learning with simulators, you can recognize the physics engine by the color of the ground plane. So a uh, bullet has this light blue ground plane. So if you have a paper and 
even if it's a blind review, you already know that it's kind of a by bullet because of the color. If it's Mujoku, it's probably like a black and white uh, background. Um, if it's Reisen, which is ETH Zurich, they often have a green background. Um, Isaac Jim, for a change, they have a gray background. So if you see the green back, back, background, there's a lot of different robots. It's probably Isaac Jim from NVIDIA. There's also Brex, which doesn't have a background, which is actually causing bugs sometimes because if there's no background, it's very hard to see how fast the object is moving. If the object is running around and there's no uh, checkerboard, um, you don't really see um, the, the motion very well. So having said that, I want to also welcome uh, people from uh, the local uh, city, from Philadelphia, because we actually have been using quite a few robots that came were made in uh, Philadelphia. Can you raise hands? Is there anyone who is from Philadelphia? Ah, there's a couple here. So it looks like most people are not from Philadelphia. Anyway, welcome to uh, the talk from Philadelphia. So Ghost Robotics, they have been making some of the robots that we uh, used uh, early on. That's the, um, the one at the top with the flexible brackets and uh, the mini tower is called. Um, we actually have been collaborating very closely with Ghost Robotics because uh, they didn't really do reinforcement learning. And if you are doing reinforcement learning with a robot, you will basically challenge the robot a lot because it will fall down, it will crash. And the, the first version was made of aluminium, which means that if it crashes a couple of times, it starts bending and the bending is persistent. So your robot has to be shipped back to Philadelphia because we couldn't repair them ourselves. So after a few iterations, they made carbon fiber uh, parts to avoid this uh, like persistent uh, deformation. And um, so you see uh, with the move from um, aluminium to carbon fiber, there was a new problem, which was the, um, the deformation. So we had a new problem for the simulation, which was the, the flexible joints. Because if you model things in simulation, often it's very rigid. It's perfectly rigid, actually. But uh, that introduced a large uh, sensorial gap. So we had to model those flexible brackets as well. The other thing, if you are doing reinforcement learning with real robots, is um, the reset function. The simulation is just one API call, reset, and you're done. That's easy. In the real world, you actually have to physically walk to the robot and reset, which is fine if you do it once. But if you do it 1,000 times, Either you become a bodybuilder and very strong, or you have to be smart and um, make a cage. So we made a lot of different cages, actually. I have one cage over there. You can see like, like a baby stroller, which follows the robot. Uh, this is the first iteration, but we had a whole series of them. And the, the cages became more and more interesting. So this is just like Home Depot, a couple of um, you know, um, self-made uh, pipes. We actually had also aluminum cages which also ships with different, with different uh, companies as well. We also made an iteration, which was a very smart cage, which was a robot in its own. It was basically like, you know, if you see this, uh, it's actually, um, it might sometimes be uh, the cables were in, impacting in motion. So we had actually a smart camera mounted um, um, constellation that follows the robot without uh, pulling the cables too much. Uh, another issue, I just want to add you some background because I think sometimes the background is just as interesting as the um, actual slides. Um, we had an intern, Jason Penn, who did some excellent work with those uh, quadrupeds. And uh, there's also a big safety issues with quadrupeds, especially with those big ones. This, um, this is the Vision 60. It's um, easy, like um, 40 pounds or something like that. And those uh, cables, they were uh, stretched quite strongly. And in one of the resets, the cable was stretched a bit too much and a piece of metal flew in the intern's face, which in this case hit his nose, which was just a scratch, but still a scratch, right? But it could have hit his eye and then um, he might have been blind. So we actually from then on added uh, safety goggles and other safety measurements. Anyway, the thing was, we were not roboticists by trade because we were computer scientists and um, machine learning engineers. Another way to do the reset is actually to train the robot to do the reset yourself, not himself, because it has legs, right? So you can see they have um, the robot falling on some kind of real world uh, objects, and then it actually can turn around and flip its legs, and it has the reset um, done. So that way you don't need a cage. That's also kind of nice. So having said that, so we have the center reel as our first paper using the quadruped robots. 
I'm going to briefly switch to a bit of pipe bullets so that people who have never seen pipe bullets, um, I will give you a few uh, notes about that. Unfortunately, the by bullet quick start guide is very hard to find. <laughs> because if you type it in Google, you get the wrong quick start guide, but you have to go to pybullet.org and then there's a link here, by bullet quick start guide. If you open that, then you're on the right location. So I quickly try to show you what it means. Okay. So what by bullet is made specifically for uh, is specifically a tools for reinforcement learning. That means it's Python, first class Python. And also it has uh, native support for uh, URDF files, Mojoko, MGCF files, and also um, all the other things that roboticists need, such as inverse kinematics, inverse dynamics. We need rendering. So we have um, a really bad render, which is actually software rendering. It's like 500 lines of code. But um, the good thing is it works everywhere, anywhere, because often um, tools in reinforcement learning happen in the cloud, and the cloud doesn't have sometimes a GPU, especially in Google, because we have uh, data centers, a lot of them, with a lot of compute, and we can use them for free almost, especially if you're working at Google. And um, they don't have a proper um, GPU sometimes, so then you need um, software render like a Swift shader or a tiny renderer. So I use tiny renderer, which is a little thing. But I also made, I really like open source. So if you want to install PyBullet, um, you can just do pip install PyBullet and you're done. There's no dependencies. There used to be a NumPy dependency, um, but uh, it also installs without NumPy. It will just slightly be slower when you do the image the transfer. So it still works without NumPy as well, but I can recommend first installing NumPy and then go ahead. So um, anyway, so you can see, you can control the, the robot with the APIs. Um, you can, there's deformable simulation as well. So there has been some papers using deformable, like uh, manipulating clothes or um, grabbing a bag and putting objects in the bag. Uh, there is, uh, as I said, um, collision detection queries. So you can do like, um, if you want to do path planning with trajectory generation, you can actually query the, the distance between the nearest objects. There is, um, inverse dynamics, inverse kinematics. There's also virtual reality, at least it was there. I, I'm not sure if it's still up to date right now. But um, by bullet is set up in a way that you can have shared memory connection. So you can basically um, set up a, a physics server and then using shared memory, you can uh, connect using um, like the HTC5 or uh, anything like um, which is open VR support and you can connect to the running pipe wall simulation and then you can interact um, quite nicely and you can pick up objects and and then finally those debugging tools and plugin support okay so that was a little bit of pipe bullets since um, I'm here in the terminal window I might be able to show you a little bit about pipe bullets live Let's see. So PyBullet GitHub is a part of Bullet. And um, if you go to examples, PyBullet, it's right here. That's where the actual implementation of PyBullet is. If you then go a bit further into gym and examples, you can see, it's the wrong direction. PyBullet amps and then examples. There is a bunch of pre-trained uh, models here. So for example, the ant, that's the Mojoko ant and the Mojoko half cheetah. Since Mojoko was a bit earlier than Bullet in the reinforcement learning world, um, most of the baseline papers have been using Mojoko. And that's, uh, that makes sense, right? So there's no way to avoid the typical ant and the humanoid and all the other ones. So what you can do is actually, if you have installed by Bullet and you're a bit lucky as well, by bullet amps. You have to cross the fingers, but uh, okay. 
<laughs> so you can see it's basically a walking ant in, in an OpenGL uh, little cross. So this has been trained by OpenAI. So I work with OpenAI um, in San Francisco on um, some papers for PPO. And uh, they used uh, PyDollet as well for, the, for this. And so they gave me already the pre-trained models. The models are quite interesting, actually, because some of them um, are really hard to train. Like, um, I'll show you one, which is the, um, and I think, by the way, you can also use stable baselines to train most of, most of those uh, models already. So. Um, flag run hard. This is a really hard one actually to train. June, July 2017. You can imagine how, how long ago this is. Uh, so, so this is um, the humanoid flag run hard. So it is not a typical module. It's not just a Mojoku humanoid here. It's actually a humanoid who wants to run to a target all the time. But if you have a sharp eye, and it might not be closely visible in the Zoom meeting, but it was actually, it's, it's being torpedoed by little boxes all the time. So okay. oh, there's actually, if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, I don't know if you can zoom actually, but uh, it's being, yeah. Hit by boxes all the time, so it's quite a robust uh, humanoid actually. The funny thing is, it's all can, it also can actually uh, get up from, uh, from once it falls. So, I think it's a very exciting um, environment actually. You, ba you barely ever see it used. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was a little bit by bullets. So there is also the um, more advanced uh, by bullet used by um, Jason Peng and the team at the Google Brain. So here, um, Jason Peng has done some excellent work with deep mimic. It's basically like mimicking um, natural motion using physics engines. And um, I was very excited about that when I saw it for two reasons. One of them, he used by bullet, which is always fun, right? <laughs> but uh, more importantly, I thought this would be nice to run it on a real robot, you know, like taking an arbitrary motion and run it on a real robot and have it still balanced, you know, because of course you can uh, hang the robot trivially in a frame and just play back the motion. That's easy, but you also want to have it actually do the balancing and not fall over while it plays that motion. So that's what we did. So we, it was a fun project. It took more than a year, actually. Uh, it involved real dogs as well. So we had motion capture on dogs and uh, we are still doing that as well. DeepMind is also, um, doing similar work in this area with Mojoku. We, anyway, we have dogs, putting dogs on a treadmill. That was quite challenging <laughs> because it wants to run off all the time. <laughs> um, then uh, we basically have motion, motion capture marks on the dogs. For this particular paper, we actually use an existing data set, but we also have made some uh, motion capture ourselves. Then we um, make some inverse kinematics um, approximations of that motion capture data. Then, um, we have a reference motion that we try to simulate with a physics engine, with spy bullets, for example. And then we run on a real robot. And, um, and then it didn't work, <laughs> which was, which was um, disappointing for me because I wanted it to work. But it was a good thing for the student because PhD students want to write papers. And if it works from the first day, then there's, there's not much to write about. So he has been working with Sergey Levin. Um, at Berkeley on um, figuring out how to close that central real gap. And um, of course, there's a lot of tools like uh, randomization, you know, like you randomize the uh, masses and um, inertia, joint lengths, etc. But we did already that before, so you can't really make a paper about that anymore. So instead, he wanted to show how you can actually do fine tuning in the real world with uh, very few uh, episodes. So we basically train the actual model in a simulation. At the very end, we actually um, have some domain adaptation on the real robot. Um, it would take probably like um, another hour to explain how this works. But um, in a nutshell, it, it trains a latent space, which is very low dimensional. And then this latent space is small enough to actually do uh, the fine tuning in the real world. That's the, the short story. Uh, if you Google for this uh, title, there is a nice video and a paper, so you, you can find out all about this. The reason why we want ex to accelerate simulation is because of this problem of one to two days training. So 
initially uh, typical um, internships at Google and also I think NVIDIA is like takes three months, it's like a summer internship. If it takes one or two days to train, you can count how many trainings you can do, not so many actually. So um, if we can have much faster simulation that makes the interns much more product productive and also our setup, of course. So um, in this case, it took one to two days for training. It's not just because bipolar is so bad, you know, um, it might be not the fast physics engine, but it's not that much slower than Mojoku, but uh, it's more the way it's used. So I will talk a little bit about that. But uh, aside from that, it's actually a good idea to uh, implement your physics engine to, to exploit accelerators like GPU or TPU. So since I'm a big fan of open source, I quickly show you the open source repo of this research work. So um, there is the motion imitation repository. Since we since use it for further development to do um, model predictive control, um, the, the repo changed a lot from the original repo, but I added a tag which says paper, and that's the original um, version that was at the time of the paper. So I ran um, this week briefly um, stable baselines three to see if um, the ant bullet still works, and it does actually. So I never really touched the environment since 2017. And as I showed you, I just ran the, the playback of the pre-trained model and it still works after five years. So that's kind of nice. This doesn't always happen, by the way. Sometimes the physics engine changes a little bit and um, the pre-trained ways have to be redone. But um, anyway, so I used the stable baselines. We are actually, the, the repo that I showed you before is also using stable baselines. The funny thing is we didn't use stable baselines during the research, but uh, we used some modified internal version of um, TensorFlow, uh, some TensorFlow specific um, framework. But uh, since I like open source, I asked Jason, can we actually use something open source? And he just took stable baselines and within one week, he actually uh, did all that at the end of his internship. So I was quite impressed with the, the nice ease of use of uh, stable baseline. So heads up to that project. So, so I don't, don't want to smash uh, stable baselines or bipolar here, but um, if you actually do the timings, you can see uh, the simulation step and you can see the lot of white in between. That white is basically not doing simulation and you should be simu doing simulation right there. So if you run Mujoko without factorized environments and also by bullet, you get like 300 to 400 steps per second uh, on my machine uh, without doing like multi-threading all of the things, right? Um, that's not really um, helping you much because uh, I skipped this briefly because I come back to this. Uh, we did a few more physics engines. One of them is the tiny differential simulator, which is not an internship project with Eric Haydn. Uh, it's a very nice little physics engine, I think. I really like it actually. Unfortunately, it's C. So a lot of people are kind of moved away from the C uh, aspect. But um, the main point here is that uh, if you run this and or the like Lycago robot on a single thread on this, this particular um, MacBook, it runs more than 100,000 frames per second. Actually, it can be 190,000 frames per second on a single thread. So that's pure everything Python, uh, everything C++. So there's no Python involved here. I did actually make Python bindings to show how to do this uh, with um, reinforcement learning uh, approach. Um, TDS or tiny differential simulator comes with an um, implementation, C++ implementation of augmented random search, ARS, uh, which is more like a brute force um, search in like, uh, you know, in, in the policy parameter space. So anyway, um, it, it basically means that if you're already 100,000 frames per second on a single thread, you can imagine if you have a lot of threads or a lot of cores, even on a CPU, you can get close to a million steps per second. Uh, that's purely simulation, by the way. If you add also the training and the order of the workflow, it drops back to maybe like a few hundred, a few hundred thousand uh, steps per second. Now, you would say bluff is not true. So <laughs> let's see. So I'm going to show you how it looks like. Tiny differential simulator builds. 
three T. So you can build on your machine as well. And there is an ARS train policy, um, OMP like ago. Uh, there is also actually a, a CUDA version of this. Since, uh, and that, that's actually an interesting aspect of accelerating simulators. Uh, if you take Rex or TDS, or also uh, like the um, WARAP that I will talk about in a little bit, if there's still time. And there's also um, Isaac, Jim, and Physics, and Video Physics, they, they run on the accelerator on GPU. And um, PyTorch also runs on GPU. So you want to stay on GPU, right? And um, I'm going to start the simulation now. I need to do one more thing, actually. It runs using OpenMP, but I cannot use all the threads, so I need to run this line to only use a few threads. So I'm going to use four threads. And now it's going to train in the background. So as I said, with these physics engines, they, um, they work best on accelerator. Now, TDS is written in C++, which is not trivial to be moved onto CUDA or accelerators. But the nice thing is, it actually is also differentiable. And now the interesting bit, if you take Rex or WARP or um, TDS, they actually have a certain way to record the physics simulation so that they can do the back propagation through the physics engine. This is called a tape. And this tape uh, can be used for getting the gradients in the forward pass and the backwards pass. You can do like um, reverse modes of differentiation with, those, uh, with that tape. But the tape can also So once you have the tape, you can actually um, do code gen. For C++, we use CPPAD code gen, which is also an open source project. If you do that, you can actually run one simulation step. It creates C code which is super fast C code actually that has no memory allocations. It has basically optimized um, until you cannot even read the code anymore. <laughs> but uh, the nice thing is the code runs on very efficiently using OpenMP because there's no branches. You know, uh, TDS and also uh, Brex, they are basically implemented in a way, a JAX friendly way. That means that there's no um, if, no branches. Wherever there's a branch, you need a where, NumPy where or a PyTorch where, you know? So this physics engine has been written with that in mind. There's not a single if um, in there, actually, that is important. So um, that means that all the threads are all in the CUDA and also all the threads in OpenMP, they run exactly the same lockstep uh, instruction. So it's ideal case uh, SMD. That's how you can get 100,000 second, right? So you can see it's already almost training while we are speaking on, the, on this machine. So let's see. So I briefly want to show you Brex as well, since um, since I think it's worth mentioning. Brex GitHub. So I did work with Brex, by the way, uh, with the Brex team as well while I was at Google Research, more as an advisory role because um, there was already a team developing it, but um, I, I helped with um, some bits and pieces. And uh, if you go to Google Brex uh, on GitHub, just Google for Brex on GitHub, it's quite nice actually. It also has the famous uh, you know, reinforcement learning environments. The cool thing is it trains also in a few minutes, like two minutes, rather than hours. And um, it also does that in a collab. So instead of having to set up your machine with Python, you don't need to set up, you just need a browser, you just need Google Chrome. You just op open Google Chrome, you go to that um, Rex um, collab, and then you can start training. By the way, you can do the same as uh, stable baselines, but I, I think they are going to show that, but I want to also show that with um, Ms. Rex. Principal browser. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, one more time. You need Google Chrome and not Safari, apparently. So, we go to this um, next environment. And 
then we normally you have to connect actually and um, there are different connections you can do local connection so if you have a gpu already you can actually set up a jupyter connection to your browser and then you can connect to your local runtime that means you don't need to pay for fast uh, gpu but um you can also pay a little bit to google and you can get access to gpu machines or tpu machines so anyway if we do this here i think it selects automatically like a, a tpu machine now it's going to install a little bit, but that's fine. Uh, it's, it's not going to take that, that long. Uh, everything is set up, so it's very nice uh, for your environment, for your um, you know, workflow. So Jax is based on, uh, sorry, Brex is based on Jax. Uh, how many people have ever used Jax? Not so many. So Jax is basically the follow-up uh, of TensorFlow. It's um, like a deep learning framework, but it's a bit more, uh, uh, geared towards custom development. You know, uh, TensorFlow and also PyTorch, they are more, mostly like tensor-based uh, frameworks where everything is very wide. Jax is a bit more, allows you to do more Python-based workflow. So, and it automatically um, compiles to us either CPU, GPU, or TPU. So you can just choose your target um, platform and it will compile using the, I think it's LLVM uh, infrastructure. So we are running it now. So now then typically you can actually choose which environment. So you can choose like uh, one of those, like half cheetah, hopper, humanoid, leech, etc. So let's leave it as the end. I'm now going to play it. It has a little visualizer as well, so you can see the end for all directions. Uh, you know, it's the main character today. Um, so then we are going to make a rollout here. This is the tiny render, by the way. It's a 500 line, you know, very educational C, C, C++ render. If you're interested vaguely in rendering, I highly recommend you to actually Google for tiny render on GitHub because it explains you the basics of render. And then it has an implementation in 500 lines of code. If you are not a C++ person, you can actually also search for the tiny render Python implementation. It does rendering. OBJ waveform from inloading, texture mapping, and also the actual software rendering in 100 lines or 99 lines of um, Python code. And there's no real dependencies in there, it's just NumPy actually. So I think the OBJ loader is like five lines or six lines. That's it. So of course, it might not be very, very uh, feature rich, but uh, it does actually, it's quite nice actually. So if you want to know uh, where to find it, uh, you can also ask me uh, separately. So one of the drawbacks of Jax is actually that it has this uh, very slow compilation. So that uh, we had an internship uh, together with Eric Heide, uh, David Miller, who was actually using Jax to write a differential physics engine. So we had two interns, both doing differential simulation. One initially both started with Jax, but uh, I noticed that uh, it took like uh, 10 minutes or 20 minutes at that time to compile the kernel which is very demotivating if you want to do research. So I decided for Eric Heide to go uh, C++, partly because I'm mostly C++ uh, educated, and also because I, want, I didn't want that uh, slow turnaround. David Miller continued with, um, with Jax, but um, it was quite challenging at the time. It has been improved a lot, and I think Jax also supports uh, caching of the kernels now, but not automatically. So we basically have to manually uh, save it. So, okay, so we have um, visualization of the followed. Oh, I didn't train it yet, I think. Okay, anyway, um, I think we are, it, it takes too long uh, to, um, I didn't prepare this, but uh, you just follow this and in two minutes, you should be able to, to train this. Here it's not trained actually. Oh wait, it's actually fine. This is tiny render by the way, this white one here. So it lets you render an image. Um, so Brex also has tiny render support now. So I think this is enough for Brex uh, for now. Back to current slide. Oh wait, I, the computer's a bit slow because it might be still training in the background. Oh 
outputs is done training. Anyway, if you run that training, it gets you the weight. It spits out the weights if whenever you get the better um, rewards, and then you can copy that into a C++ file. Okay. Okay. Um, now, um, there's a lot of other tools. There are stable baselines. There is um, JAX and BRAX, which have their own PPO and SAC implementation. At NVIDIA with Isaac Jim and also Isaac Sim, we are using OL Games, which is also an open source ML library. It's uh, specifically optimized for the um, factorized environment and also like uh, very low uh, overhead. So you can see we trained um, the ant in uh, Mojoku and uh, also with uh, the ant with Isaac, Isaac Jim and Isaac Sim, Omniverse Isaac Jim. And you get typically like a couple of hundred thousand steps per second during training, and maybe like a million steps um, if, if you're properly set up. So you can just visit the link if you're interested in this. It can also train uh, Mojoku, and I'm going to add a uh, tiny differential simulation training as well, so you can also do it on the CPU. So you can see I made a starting point uh, integrating into TDS. I want to do it for this for this uh, today for this, but I didn't get it done yet. But you can see how it would look like uh, the installation. You basically import your physics engine, and then you have uh, two API calls, so a step and a reset. Now, for my C++ ARS implementation, I call the step all the time. And also, the reset is called for all environments at once. So you basically have a rollout, one, one API call that does a full rollout for 1,000 environments. And the rewards for all the environments. And then you call the, the reset for all the environments. It turns out that um, Orel games and some other libraries, they want to have the reset being called when, during the step as well. So whenever one of the environments is done, you want to call the reset for that specific environment. It's a small little change in C++, but I didn't have it done before today. So the Mojoku lines look like this with Orel games. So you see the, the command line, how to train Mojoku. In a few minutes, you have a humanoid running around already. So instead of hours, uh, you can do it in two minutes. So that's kind of exciting, I think. Brex, I, um, I foresaw that things would not work out exactly, so I put a training curve, um, how it looks like in the core lab. It also basically takes a couple of minutes to, to train um, an ant. But uh, the funny thing is, or not so funny actually, that the time to JIT is actually almost the same as it's time to train. <laughs> and somehow they still haven't sorted out that uh, automatic um, caching of the kernel. So you basically do the training, you wait one minute all the time, and then you train one minute. So it basically doubles the waiting time, basically. So and we had a, a Twitter conversation about this. Uh, it's similar to, it reminds me of this uh, Dropbox discussion on Hacker News, where they said, like, when Dropbox just came out, who, who can ever use Dropbox? It will never be success because you, any Linux users can typically mount a drive, a USB drive, and you're done. But um, if you're a technical user, uh, you don't need Dropbox probably. But uh, for all, all the other people out of us, you want Dropbox or something like, like Google Drive just for the ease of use. And it's the same with, um, with reinforcement learning tools as well. And you know, it, you don't want to make a lot of effort to do the to implement kernel caching. So because no one is going to do it. You know? So um, let me introduce Warp which is um, a project that is NVIDIA. I'm super excited about WARP actually, because um, it's similar, vaguely similar to the idea of um, Rex and also JAX, but uh, it's much cooler. So <laughs> it lets you write um, kernels and, and code, uh, simulation code in, in Python. Then you compile it and it actually runs on a CPU or on a GPU. So it runs on, it's not just GPU, it runs on CPU or GPU, cross platform, it even runs on my Mac actually. So, and it runs really fast on a GPU. It runs like a couple of million to 10 million steps per second fast on a, on a GPU. So it's really fast. It's actually much faster than PyTorch for the particular use cases. So it's also differentiable. So you can actually do much faster simulation. I know today is actually, um, uh, the topic is about reinforcement learning, but um, ideally you avoid reinforcement learning actually, you know. It's, Reinforcement learning is nice if you don't know exactly how to solve the problem, but in a lot of cases, you do know how to solve the problem. So that's why for locomotion, we can use model predictive control, for example. And um, 
for um, for a lot of other things, you can do gradient-based optimization, basically. So you, because the physics engine can provide gradients, we don't need to use some kind of um, PPO uh, algorithm to find those gradients again, because you already have them. You can back propagate to the entire physics engine. So I'm, I might have a few examples of what that means. So, so as I mentioned about this kernel time, um, WARP automatically does this by default. So you have a lot of kernels typically, and whenever you change one kernel, you only compile, you pay the cost for compiling that single kernel. So that's really nice. Uh, also, it has a built-in built mass and geometry library, so it's made specifically for writing physics engines or things like that. So you can expect a lot of cool um, simulation tools based on WARP. The other thing is uh, NVIDIA already has a physics engine, NVIDIA PhysX, and um, it's also GPU and it's much more full features. So I don't think WARP, you, you shouldn't, look at WARP as a full featured physics engine. Neither Brex. Brex is more like reinforcement learning tool, which is kind of more like uh, to, uh, to publish papers, academic papers. But uh, if you want to have something learn on the real robot, you want to have more rich featured physics engine like uh, Mojoku or PyBullet or uh, Isaac, Om Omniverse Isaac, Jim or Sim. So, but WARP can still be useful in that case because you still need to write that reward function and you might want to write it in Python. And the thing is, if you write a reward function in Python while the physics engine is in um, on the GPU, you don't want to copy the data back on the GPU, do some kind of computation for the reward and send it back, then you lost all your performance. So the nice thing about WARP is that you can actually write your reinforcement learning reward function in Python. You, you run it, it compiles it to GPU, and you basically have interrupt with the rest of PyTorch and uh, the physics engine, which runs on CUDA maybe. So that's quite cool. So you basically still maintain that Python workflow, but also maintain the, better, the, the high performance and you, your differential. So you can see here a few of those um, uh, topics, uh, like, um, let's really say that. You can see the, the underlying infrastructure, infrastructure if you're interested. There is actually a much more rich um, explanation by Miles Macklin, my colleague, who is the, the main author of WARP. So if you just Google for um, WARP on GitHub, it's also open source, so it's quite exciting. Uh, if you look down, there is actually links to the video, which has a lot of explanation how to use WARP and also really nice, cool videos. So WARP is integrated with Omniverse. That's the main project that I'm working on right now. And um, it lets you do um, very cool things with, uh, like Omniverse is kind of, um, let me see, I might have actually a bit of Omniverse because NVIDIA wants me to probably at least mention it today. <laughs> <laughs> I better do. So Omniverse is actually um, a really nice tool. So you might think of it as Metaverse, but it's actually not really like that. <laughs> it's actually more something like um, a unifying tool. You can think of it like um, a connection bridge that bridges um, standards like uh, physics and USD and uh, open standards. You can also use Gazebo nowadays, actually. So there's a connector from Gazebo uh, to uh, Omniverse, open source. Um, I plan to add a bullet connector as well, and Mojoku will likely be supported as well. So it's kind of a framework that lets you do really ni nice high quality rendering, like RTX rendering with um, real time uh, ray tracing and pass tracing. And then it has also these connections to uh, tools, infrastructure. So you can do like digital twin. So like Amazon and BMW, they use Omniverse to make a copy of the warehouse or the factory. And uh, you can also actually do reinforcement learning straight inside Omniverse. There is um, a tool called Isaac Gem, which is currently separate from Omniverse, but uh, it's being integrated into Omniverse, and then you basically get uh, all those connections with Gazebo and it becomes a whole infrastructure. Uh, you can see here uh, this Gazebo bridge, where there is Ross on one side with Isaac Tim. Um, again, I cannot really go in detail about all the explanations. There is another, um, there is some sessions probably that explain a bit about Isaac Sim. And, uh, but um, you basically can simulate robots on large scale very nicely. So like if you have a um, warehouse like Amazon, you might have thousands of robots and all kind of um, 
packages and it's not like a little reinforcement learning uh, example where you have one robot and one little thing. You, typically, if you want to deploy it in the real world, you want to scale, you want to you know, put it in a real factory and that's what we can do with Omniverse. So instead of having one little robot with the environment and an agent as um, was already explained before, we actually have lots of robots um, many more than this actually. So this is just an example with a few robots, but we can have 4,000 robots, for example, doing the same task. So that's how, how we can scale up the simulation speed much more. And everything is running on a GPU with either with PyTorch and the physics engine inside Omniverse. So in action, you send a whole vector of tensor of actions. And the observation and rewards is also returned as a whole tensor of them. So all the typical environments like ant and humanoid and all of them are implemented in Isaac Jim and Omniverse sim as well. But also they have this uh, really cool um, LA hand with uh, cube manipulation like the OpenAI uh, example. They have the ATH Zurich animal robot with the super thing. Those um, and then um, yeah, lots, lots more. So you can see here the training of the, um, the hand manipulation. And instead of one hand, you have thousands of hands training in parallel. And um, to give you an idea, originally the paper uh, was training in 40 hours, and now we can do this in 40 minutes. And I'm betting that in not so much time, we can do it in a couple of minutes, actually. So um, the, the development goes really quick in this area. So, that's, that's the nice thing of, of uh, GPU and TPU accelerators. So then you can see how the animal robot is kind of um, a quite heavy robot, by the way. It's, it's uh, not like a toy robot. Uh, it's, it's like, I don't know by head, but it's quite heavy to carry. 80, 80, yeah, 80 kilograms. So I can carry it, but I will have back pain afterwards. <laughs> but uh, that means it's unsafe uh, if you make a bug in your reinforcement learning. But it's, it's, it's quite amazing, actually. It can actually uh, learn how to stand on the two legs, you know. And all this training is also um, in Legged Gym. I put a link in there so you can actually do this yourself as well. That was actually an open source uh, Legged Gym repository using Isaac Gym. So you can see this. This is actually uh, super cool, I think. If you wait a little bit, you will see the actual robot coming up. There it is. It can actually stand on legs. Yeah. And actually, it can also walk up the stairs on, this leg, uh, on two legs, actually. And uh, do many more cool things. So it's quite impressive. And the, the cool thing is, at least from my perspective, it's trained fully in simulation. So no cycles hurt on the real robot. You just have a simulator, uh, you train the policy in, in, in real in simulation and you deploy it in the real world. So there was a bit more um, examples here. What's the time? Uh, how many? Okay, there's uh, 10 minutes left. Okay. So as I mentioned, Jason Peng, he was my intern at Google Brain for um, one year, actually three months and then another um, nine months as students uh, research. So we, we extended uh, his internship for another, uh, for, for, to cover the year. But um, he has since moved to NVIDIA as well, just like me and myself, and uh, he enjoyed fast simulation. And um, you can see um, this AMP adversarial motion fires um, being trained very fast now. So it also trains them on the GPU and also many of them in parallel. Another intern, has been uh, Mohamed Hassan has also been using the same simulation to learn how to sit on the chairs. And um, yeah, with those tools, you can actually really be very productive um, as, a, as a student, um, researcher, or intern, but also as professional roboticist, of course. There's a few more um, cool um, projects by Jason Bang in NVIDIA with, uh, together with uh, Sanya Fitness. Oh. So here we actually try to reuse the skills that we learn. And um, you can see how they pre use pre-trained motion skills. And uh, here there is another, uh, I cannot go in detail. I just want to show you the, the, the cool things that have been done with the simulation at scale. And this can also run in the Omniverse and then you can make much nicer rendering than the tiny renderer, which is 500 lines, right? 
No, this is a better render. Yeah. This is the um, Isaac Jim render. But uh, if you would actually do it in Omni first, it can be photorealistic. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah, yeah, but it's still a kind of programmer artwork, right? It's not like um, good enough for a movie, for example. Yeah. yeah. But um, so then uh, we are, as I said, we are ongoing moving them together. Like the Omniverse um, is like the high quality rendering with RTX with uh, pass tracing. Uh, Isaac Jim is the fast simulation and fast training, and then we are moving them together into one framework. And um, let's see. Yeah, there's a bit of uh, how to use the API, but uh, I think you can also find all of this online if you're really motivated. Um, so this will all become available. This Omniverse update will be available soon, I think in a couple of uh, weeks, I guess, if all goes well. So um, I think it's exciting. Um, now I have a few more minutes because I think it's not about reinforcement learning, but I think it's still very, um, very cool. Because as I said, it's better to, to do not reinforcement learning so um, I skip some of this because uh, you already know this. So what we want is actually move this all together, as I mentioned already. Uh, the next thing is uh, for, for robotics, we want actually very high quality simulation. And one of the most challenging um, topics is putting a, a bolt on the screw and having it actually sim uh, simulate and work. Because often what you would do is actually just put uh, like a constraint and make it like a spherical, um, you know, constraint and make it work. This is actually using collision detection to have the screw on the bolt and it actually works in real time. So it's quite uh, impressive, I think. So this is also part of, um, of the tool chains of NVIDIA. It's using um, sign distance field, SDF collision. Uh, I think it's super cool anyway. So you can basically imagine that uh, if you have such high quality simulation, you can do a lot of more interesting things. Like in PyBullet, we cannot do this. We cannot do this uh, quality um, at the moment because basically we we get too many conflicting constraints, and then the, um, the bolt will fly off the screw um, if you don't set it up properly. So this is kind of quite a major step uh, forward, I think. And um, we can also have reinforcement learning environments learning to actually screw the bolt uh, with a robot. So that's kind of cool. Uh, this is another uh, synthetic data generation. So uh, um, if you want to have things work in the real world you, and you use simulation, simulated data, it might not work, the simple real gap. So we want to have kind of um, a lot of randomization and synthetic data generation. So we have tools for that. The Omniverse. Uh, the other thing is, um, this is another ongoing project where we have um, key point generation for the for the vision part. So we take vision out of the loop by basically um, training the vision model to recognize the position of the cube, and then we can do the reinforcement learning on the low dimensional uh, representation. One thing that I'm very excited about is this uh, perception in the loop, because that's what we use in a lot of projects as well. And also real people have perception in the loop, right? At least most of lucky, most lucky people of us have working eyes. And um, so I think these forms of learning should also be able to work with actual uh, vision input. So that, and if you do that uh, with an older version of Isaac Jim, it will be a bit slow because um, you, the rendering becomes the bottleneck. But we will have tools to basically render um, tons of images at very high speed. So, there is a project that I'm not going to talk about, but it's called Megaverse, which is open source. And uh, you can look it up there, uh, megaverse.info. It has this concept implemented already as open source. It's not um, as full featured, it's based more like a student project, but uh, it has the, um, a lot of the concept in there. And um, more like a small advertisement if you're interested in NVIDIA, there's a lot of follow sessions. Um, NVIDIA has this. Uh, intern this um, conference. So that's the end. I still have some slides. Um, one slide, actually, I want to let me see. That I didn't talk about, but I'm more excited about. It's this one here. So as I mentioned, uh, you don't want to do reinforcement learning if it's, not, if it's not needed, so you can use differential simulation. 
differential simulation is also useful if you want to learn um, fast because you can exploit the gradients and then you basically use um, uh, optimized algorithm that exploits gradients directly. So you don't need PPO. You can use LFB, BFGS or another um, like gradient based optimization method. So if you take a differential simulator like a TDS, tiny differential simulator, or um, Brex or WARP or another differential simulator, type each here, I think, and you combine that with a differential renderer, then you can actually train the neural network weights with respect to this um, reward function all the way from beginning to the end. And then we have that um, we had the idea to basically um, generate the URDF file, you know, the robot description straight from video. And you can see that working actually. We have a research paper uh, this year at the IROS. And the input video is basically um, the pixel space. Then we have a couple of manual steps. So ideally, it should work end to end, you know, from pixels to your DF file. That was, but that's the, the, the end goal kind of for this. Um, because if you can do that, if you basically have a camera and you do end to end trading um, and get your DF file, it means that you understand the world but you, because you can compress it into a meaningful representation. Then you can use physics simulation to do the forward prediction, just like people do, right? Because if, if I asked you the following thing, close your eyes, uh, think about um, you're on the, at the beach, you roll, a ball is rolling down, a small kid rolls the ball down the beach, it falls into the water, the kid is running towards to get the ball, the kid is really small, it can just barely walk. You probably already think like, ah, oh, the kid might drown, so let's help the kid, right? You already uh, imagine all the things that's surrounded by this whole story, right? And then uh, you start running towards the ball and picking it up. And then I can tell you, do this um, three times, you know, and you can basically can Im immediately you make a simulation in yourself and you can already know what to do from that all out in your head kind of. Robots could also benefit from that. So if the robot can actually take the pixels, extract it into simulation data, then you basically give it some um, context and let it kind of um, do, the, do the forward simulation again from its own model. So that's, that's kind of the, um, the end goal of this kind of branch of um, scene understanding. Okay, so th that's now I'm actually done. I mean, if there's any questions, then that's a moment. Otherwise, I've got a question online. So, uh... Um, I'm actually currently using as engine right now for my research. So I just want to clarify. So right now, Omniverse and as engine are two different things, right? And like, so, so when you say you combine Omniverse and as engine together, so like what exactly that process is going to be like? And do you have any timeline for that? Thank you. Okay, yeah, I don't know if the product manager wants me to give a timeline. But, uh... <laughs> If I would bet on it, it would probably be within a couple of weeks that it will be the first release. Now, having said that, uh, it's an ongoing effort, it's quite a big task, and the first release might not be as featureful uh, and as fast as uh, the original Isaac Gym. But um, what it looks like, it basically, um, it will be very similar as before, right? You basically, um, it looks like two so totally different projects, but it's not really actually, because Isaac Jim uses NVIDIA physics under the hood, and so does Omniverse. So the physics engine is the same. They also use the same reinforcement learning framework, like Aurel Games and PyTorch. So that part is also the same. So the thing that it becomes much more interesting is actually that uh, you get a whole series of tools around it. So instead of that very simple rudimentary graphics engine in Isaac Jim, you get a full features RTX vendor with. Uh, real-time ray tracing and interactive path tracing. But you also get a whole infrastructure with um, synthetic data generation, randomization. Uh, there's lots more. I think a product manager can give you more details. But uh, So I think in a couple of weeks, you probably can start playing with this, uh, I guess, you know, but I cannot promise that. Yeah. And you still get a support before a more object, right? That's all going to be in there and uh, in various ways, I think. So, deformable objects, you can also write your own deformable objects with Warp because Warp is also part of Omniverse and it also connects to this whole um, reinforcement learning um, framework. So, 
I think in Warp you can write a, a simple clause simulation in a couple of hundred lines of code, maybe less than that. So if you want to customize or do your own clause simulation, you can do it Warp and do it together as a training. That's how the future will look like for this project. That's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, maybe? I've got a question from Discord. So maybe maybe one oh, yeah. first and then. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that RL game supports vectorized environments and is used for ISAC gym and uh, also ISAC gym. Uh, I just want to understand that since everything is computed in parallel and in ISAC gym, I've been using it for a while. So everything is returned to you as one tensor of state. What's the use of vectorizing uh, the, these environments and how is it beneficial for the purpose of it? It's actually very important to vectorize this because visual vectorization. You would basically have to set individual reward functions one by one, and each call to Python is really storage. So you get called a Python calling overhead. And that's not really much, but if you do it times thousand, it becomes actually significant. It becomes actually the Python. That's actually exactly the slide that I um, wanted to point out here, but um, I probably, it's just before this slide here. So you basically have this problem here. You basically have a little bit of simulation happening and then all white because you're basically communicating the results back and forth. Um, and that's why you need factorized um, API, where there's one, API, one call to get the results and one call to send the action. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, in reinforcement learning, you often have the replay buffer, um, which I don't know, it has a varying amount of samples. So I, I feel that these vectorized environments, they are built that you have like a policy and then you have rollouts of thousands of robots at the same time. So it seems as if you completely replace perhaps the replay buffer with the experience from your current policy. Kind of, do you have benefits? Like don't the benefits kind of diminish at some point? Um, actually, it's not necessarily. You can still use a replay buffer if you want, actually, even with the vectorized environments here. Yeah. But don't you completely remove all the old experience? And Not necessarily. It? That's just a choice from the algorithm here. So okay. I think the, the, the choice of having this uh, vectorized API, you can still have um, an arbitrary like PPO or SAC or uh, another like um, offline or online uh, algorithm where you have a replay buffer yeah. and distribute it as well. You can still have distribution as well. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily a mutual exclusive that uh, you use this first the other. Um, so uh, maybe you might have to better to talk with uh, off offline about this. Yeah, there, there was one question, which yeah. is um, I've I've seen that Racim Racim is extensively used for legged robotics, apparently for its capacity to model context accurately. Does uh, bullet for pipelet treats the context in a different manner, or is it more or less the same? I mean the contact model. Uh, I can show this. Yeah, you can try this question. This question. I see. Modeling context accurately. Yeah, <laughs> that's all talking about its own, right? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, PyBall is actually being used by several robotics teams because they didn't like the Mujoku soft contact model. You know, Mujoku has this, um, it's very fast, but it has this kind of optimization based uh, contact model, which means if you take a bottle and you hold it like this and you wait an hour, it slowly creeps down actually, because optimization doesn't perfectly solve the um, constraint. Bullet, you can actually simulate it. You can, if you set up the simulation properly, which is not trivial actually, but you can set up the contact and it's actually perfectly um, sticking friction. So there's no slip at all. Now, in RISIM, they have some extra optimizations like this per contact uh, iteration, um, which is not in PyBullet right now, but it is in TDS because in TDS we exactly implemented that contact model. So if you're caring about that particular thing, you just take TDS and you basically have a RISIM style of contact model per contact. Yeah. But I don't think it's a big deal if you want to have it in PyBullet. It's, uh, you know, it's doable, but uh, if you're me at least, if you're, if you're not me, then it might take you a couple of months to dig into this 20 year old code base. Yep. Uh, maybe one last question in the audience. So from the teams. Uh, from the, from the um, 
which differential simulator would you say is the more usable and mature at this point? Oh, that is a hard question. Uh, maybe, maybe. Okay, I can quickly uh, answer. I mean, some, I mean, there's a lot of tons of simulators, and uh, the one that I would pick if you really care about differential simulation, uh, it's all on this image actually. So there is uh, one that is quite nice, which is uh, Dart Diff Sim. I think it's called Nimble Nimble Physics now by Karen Liu. It's quite nice. It's quite rich and has some analytical gradients rather than um, uh, this kind of back propagation using this. Um, I forgot the name actually, but uh, using this kind of underlying um, forward and reverse mode differentiable uh, simulation, they have analytical gradients. So that's nice. Another one that's great, I think, is Pinocchio based, Pinocchio, which is uh, made in Europe, which also is differential. So that's kind of quite, uh, they are more evolved. Whereas Brex and Warp and also um, TDS is a bit more uh, bare bone and not so full feature rich. Can you make you this differential simulation and this continuous um, problem like yeah, like robotics or something like that? Okay, I'm glad that I put a few spare slides at the very end that answers this question, which is um, okay. I get a bit too quick. So, what you want to know about is um, accelerated. The policy line with differential simulation, uh, SHAC, which is short horizon actor critic. So, indeed, if you do reinforcement learning with, uh, if you do um, training with the differential simulation, you have this problem of uh, vanishing or a very noisy gradients, right? So, you're in a long horizon, it becomes useless, actually, as you see in this picture here. So there was this paper exactly about this topic uh, using also Isaac Jim or um, Warp or something like that, um, that basically compresses the and makes the episodes much shorter so you get more high quality gradients. So yeah, you just Google for uh, this paper um, and then you, you get the information. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that again.